Welcome back to part two of the VFX breakdown video. If you haven't seen part one, go check it out. It's jam packed with information where we go over how to film your scene properly using several passes, editing and timeline organization, motion capture and post viz, lineup sheets, CG rendering using EXRs and so much more. So make sure to go check that out. This video is gonna be no different. We're gonna continue right where we left off. We'll be talking about color space and CG integration using the ACES color management workflow. Compositing in After Effects to final delivery, plus I have an update on the progress of the backlog. We have a lot to talk about today, so let's get into it. Before we get into compositing, let's talk color science, because if your color science is wrong, your VFX are never going to feel like they belong in the scene. Think of it like putting a square peg in a round hole. It's just never going to work. Today, I'm going to walk you through the ACES color management workflow. It's what I used on my YouTube video. It's also what Hollywood uses on some of the biggest projects out there. And I'm going to try and put it in terms that make sense, even if you're just starting out. Now, what is ACES? ACES stands for the Academy Color Encoding System and it was created by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And the goal of this was to standardize a color workflow throughout the process of film production, VFX, post-production, all the way through. Because there are a lot of variables when it comes to making a project. Like what camera is this being filmed with? Is there going to be digitally created assets that have to be integrated into your scene, like I did on my YouTube video? Also, what display is it gonna be seen on? Is it gonna be seen on an iPhone or a computer or maybe in a movie theater. All these are variables that have to be considered in the color workflow. And each of these variables have their own language. So think of ACES like the universal translator that speaks all of these languages. Is this the only workflow? No, but it is a very common workflow used in the Hollywood production pipeline. To understand a little bit more about these variables and color, let's take a look at this chart for a second. Now let's break this down. What is this and what does it mean? Well, first we need a representation of what the human eye can see, because Obviously, we see things in the real world and we want to present our projects as lifelike as possible. So that's going to be represented by this area here. This is what the human eye or the average human eye can see. Anything inside this area is visible to the human eye and anything outside this area is not visible to the human eye, but it still could exist mathematically. So if the goal is to make our footage and VFX look as lifelike as possible, then it needs to fit within this range as much as possible. So let's call this our baseline. Now let's look at the ACES color gamut. It is a massive area that encompasses not only what the human eye can see, but it reaches farther than that. So now that we have have a baseline of what the human eye can see. Now we need to capture it, and this is done using a camera. The cameras have gotten pretty good at capturing the color in the real world, but each camera has their own unique approach to trying to reach the same goal, which is what the human eye can see. Sony has their own color science. Ari has their own black magic, Canon, you name it. All of these have their own unique language in trying to capture the color in the real world. Now, because this is where the color is captured or coming in, let's call this our input. We want to remember that later on. Now, what happens if you have CG characters or a CG environment that isn't being captured in a camera, but rather digitally created? When choosing what color space you want to work with, you want to choose one that gives you the most latitude as possible. When I created my characters in Maya, I chose to use the ACES CG color space since we're using the ACES color management workflow. So now that we've captured our color with the camera or we've created our digital assets, the next variable along the way is going to be how we see it or how it's displayed. Now there's a wide variety of different displays. There's your iPhone or iPad, there's your laptop or a computer monitor, there's your 4K HD TV or there's the movie theater. All of these again have different languages that they speak to try and represent the color back from the real world. Plays have gotten better over the years, but they actually still encompass a pretty small range of what the human eye can see. Rec 709, which is the standard for most devices, actually it covers a pretty small area of the human eye. You also have something like DCI P3, which is used in cinema and other higher end devices, and it covers a larger area. But as you can see, it's still not that big. But since this is where our color is ultimately going to be displayed or going out. Let's call this our 
output. We'll have to remember that later on as well. And the footage was shot using the Sony FX3 in the color space of S-Log3 S Gamma 3 Cine. Now the CG characters was rendered out of Maya using Aces CG. If you want to follow the next steps along with me, I do have the exact same assets that I'm going to be using today available for download if you want to follow along with me. You just click the link in the description below. For compositing today, the program I'm going to use is After Effects. It's a very powerful program. It's also very accessible to a lot of people, especially if you have an Adobe subscription and you have Premiere Pro, it probably came with After Effects as well. So today we're going to use After Effects, but it's important to note that one of the more common or standard VFX compositing programs is called Nuke. But today we're in After Effects. Let's dive in. Now I want to note that there are a number of different ways that you can go about doing this. This is just my preferred way of doing it. The first thing we need to do in After Effects is go to our project settings and head over to the color tab. For color engine, we're going to select OCIO. And for the configuration, we're going to select ACES. If you're wondering what OCIO is, just think of ACES is the system or rules, but OCIO is After Effects' engine that's going to be doing the mathematical equations for us. Now under the color settings for bit depth, we want to make sure that we're at 32-bit float. And for color space, we want to make sure that we're set to ACES CG. For display color space, I'm going to set this to none. This is not always the way you want to do this, but this is the way I'm going to do this for this tutorial. You'll see why later on. So now we've told After Effects that we want to work in the ACES color workflow. The next thing we want to do is make sure that our footage is in the right color space as well. So I'm going to select one of my Sony clips. I'm going to right click and select Interpret Footage Main. From here, I want to navigate to the Color tab. Here is where we can select our footage color space or our input. And for this example, it's going to be S-Log 3 S gamut 3 cine. I can remember that interpretation and then I can apply that interpretation to the rest of my clips. Next, let's do the same thing to our CG renders. We're going to right click interpret footage main. We want to make sure that our input is ACES CG. And again, we want to apply that interpretation to the rest of the renders. So now that we have our project and color settings all set up, now let's bring in our first clip into a comp. Now remember, we've already told After Effects what the camera color space is. So we are good, but why does it look funky? That's because we're working in a color space that's larger than the color space of the monitors that we're viewing this on. This is because we had set our display color space to none, so right now it still doesn't know what color space it wants to view it on. Now we can change this a number of different ways. We can go back into the project settings and select an option for display color space. Also in the composite window, we can select it from there as well. But for now, I want to leave Leave both of those set to none because I want to control this in the comp and you'll see why here in just a second. So let's talk about my preferred way of doing this. So let's first create an adjustment layer in After Effects and let's name this adjustment layer Output Transform. Then in our effects window, let's search for OCIO. Remember this is After Effects' engine that does the math. When you do that, you can see there's a number of options. I want to select Color Space Transform. Let's drag that onto our adjustment layer. For input, we're going to select select ACES CG because that's the color space that we've told After Effects that we're working in. For output, this is where you can select whatever monitor or color space you're in, like Rec. 709, sRGB, DCI-P3, or whatever, or you can convert your output to any one of these multiple options, which is why I like this method, is it gives me control right in the comp on an adjustment layer. For this situation, for my output, I want to select S-Log3, s Gamut 3 Cine. There's a reason for this. When I film my YouTube videos like you're seeing now, I film using the FX3 and S-Log3 s Gamut 3 Cine color space. When I bring my footage into Premiere, I apply a color LUT that I created in DaVinci Resolve that not only applies the color adjustments that I want on my clip, but it also converts my clip from S-Log3 s Gamut 3 Cine to a Rec. 709 display color space. So I choose this workflow in my comp, not just because I want to see what my clips look like with this LUT applied, but also my CG characters. It applies that look to both combined, which is only going to help with integration. So let's create another adjustment layer in our comp above our output color space. Let's call this Sony LUT. Back to the effects window, we want to search for LUT, and let's drag apply LUT onto the adjustment layer, and let's search for our LUT. This is included in the download.
downloads as well, by the way. I want to make both of these adjustment layers guide layers because I don't want them to be baked into my final render when I do my output. You can bake the LUT into your final render if you want to. It does technically save you a step, but I do like still to have control bringing my footage from the comp render into Premiere Pro and apply the LUT there because it still gives me color control in Premiere. Now the great thing about working this way is anything I put underneath these two adjustment layers will have that color look applied. So let's test this. Let's bring one of our CG characters now into the scene. This will go above our Sony footage but below the adjustment layers. Now because we rendered EXRs from Maya, there's an effect in After Effects called Extractor and you can see that the e E, X, and R is capitalized, cleverly, I guess. That's what we'll be using to apply to our 3D renders to have control over the different AOVs that we rendered along with our EXRs. So now it comes time to try and make our character fit into the scene a little bit better. We're gonna use those AOVs that we put in the metadata to control this. So I wanna take this layer, I wanna duplicate it about three times. This will give us a total of four layers in our timeline. Let's call the bottom one shadow mat and let's select shadow mat in the extractor effect. Then let's turn this layer off. It'll be important later on. The next layer up, let's call this one beauty. The one above that, let's label AO, which stands for ambient occlusion. And in the extractor effect, we wanna select AO. The one above that, let's name spec for specular. And in the extractor effect, we're going to select coat. On the AO layer, let's change the blending mode to multiply. And for the spec layer, let's change that blending mode to add. All right, this is already looking pretty good, but we need to dial in our shadows. Remember, we have our shadow matte layer at the bottom that we've turned off. We're gonna leave it off, but this is gonna help us control or dial in our shadow layers. Let's create a new adjustment layer, and let's call this shadow exposure. I wanna drop this adjustment layer just above our footage layer, but below all the rest of our 3D renders. Let's set the track matte to shadow matte. The shadow matte is going to act as an alpha and then we're going to add an exposure effect onto our adjustment layer and bring the exposure down. And you can see that the shadows now are starting to show up. This is a very basic comp, but even with these basic steps, you can see that the result is pretty great. So you can apply these exact same steps to the other character or any other CG asset that you've created that you need to put into your scene. Again, if you wanna practice these techniques, I've made these assets available for download. Just click the link below in the description. I've included the Sony S-Log3 footage, the Sony LUT that we're gonna need to use for this workflow, and EXR single frame renders of each of our characters. I've also included the After Effects project file that I used in this video. That way you can see what I've done and apply it and learn from it if you need. So now that we have our comp looking good, let's now render it out and send it to Adobe Premiere Pro. Remember that we set our adjustment layers to guide layers, so it's only going to be a temporary reference. It will not be baked into our final render. When we choose our render, I want to go to color and make sure that S-Log3 as Gamut 3 Cine is selected for our output color space. That way when I bring it into Premiere Pro, I can apply my LUT just like I would normally and it'll be as if it's just footage that I shot in my studio. So now let's go back into Premiere Pro. Let's cut all of our shots in. Let's make sure that they're looking good and if there's anything wrong, then we can hopefully just go back to our comp and make a couple of fine tuned adjustments and then send it back to Premiere Pro. Let's hope that we don't have to go back to Maya and then re-render them because that's basically starting the process all over again. So we want to avoid that when possible, which is why it's best to work everything out ahead at a time that you need, hit render from Maya once and then fix everything in the compositing stage. Okay, the VFX is looking good. Our characters are looking awesome. They're now dancing and animating to the music. And next thing you know, just like that, the same techniques used on big Hollywood shows helped a YouTube channel bring a 3D character and scene to life. This proves that it's not necessarily about the big Hollywood budget, but it's about the process and the passion behind it. And if you employ these techniques as well, you too can make movie magic. 
I want to give another shout out to our amazing sponsor, Epidemic Sound, for not just believing in me and what I'm doing on this channel, but for also believing in all creators and artists alike. Not only is Epidemic Sound the best sound tracking platform for creators with high quality music and sound effects that are restriction free, but they're also launching a new AI tool called Adapt. With Adapt, you can do things like tweak a track's mood, making it more moody or dreamy or or upbeat to match your scene better. You can also reduce its intensity, making room for dialogue. You can also add an instrument that's missing to better match your scene. You can even remove, rearrange, or even reimagine sections of your chosen track. You can edit the track length to fit your content and so much more. But the really cool thing about this is that you are tweaking music made by real artists. Epidemic Sound is the front runner in AI sound tracking, empowering human creativity, not replacing it, but rather enhancing it. They are committed to investing in real artists and growing how they can earn from AI powered usage. As a creator myself, I think this is amazing and I am proud to have Epidemic Sound as a sponsor of this channel. If you want to test out the adapt features and check out all the other great music and sound effects from Epidemic Sound, then click the link in the description below and use code imagine50 where you'll get 30 days free plus 50% off for your first two months. Thank you again to Epidemic Sound for supporting this channel. All right, before we wrap up the video, let's talk about the Backlot. If you don't know what it is, it's a community that I'm trying to build to help share more knowledge like this with you. Right now, there's only a wait list, but it is coming together. And right now, I wanted to show a bit of the progress with you. This is not a course. This is not a one and done, watch it and I'm done. This is a living, growing filmmaking community. It's built for learning and connecting and growing as filmmakers together and dive deeper than you can on YouTube. Now let's look at the progress so far. If you were a member, you would go to the login page, type in your username and password, and then this is the page that you would see as you log in. This home page will give you a sense of how to navigate through the community. On the left hand side, you see that I've created different discussion groups based on topics. So if you have a question about VFX or editing, you can go into that discussion group and ask a question or post something. Each individual member can contribute to those. If you have a question, post on that board. I can respond to it, but other people can as well. I also get a lot of questions from people here on YouTube asking me to dive deeper or to explain something in more detail or to get into super specifics about something. That's not something that's easily placed into YouTube because you have to worry about the thumbnail and title and algorithm. If you want these deep dive tutorials, I'm going to be adding them into a tutorial section. So like I said, it's not a course, but if you have a question and where you want a deep dive in like say how to do a lineup sheet, then I'm gonna add that into the backlot tutorial section. It is going to be constantly growing and information is gonna be constantly fed into that area. Within the backlot, I want to encourage collaboration. I want to do challenges where I can test skills and win prizes. I want to encourage real community learning, not just passive watching of a video. I've already started creating a library of downloads that I like to share with you when I do my YouTube videos. That's only going to grow and get bigger and more in depth in the back lot. As a member, each download will be there for you as part of your membership. I think of the back lot as like one of my editing timelines. An editing timeline starts with nothing and at the end, it looks like a complex, crazy piece of work. Right now, I'm still in the infancy stage of building this, but it is building, it is evolving, and it will launch soon. If you're interested in this, then please join the waitlist and be notified when it officially launches. When it launches, you could be the first members that helps shape what this is and what it can be and where it can go. I want to send a quick thank you to those who are already on the waitlist and supporting it. I'm really excited about this and I hope to have it launch real soon. That was a long one. That does it for this video. I hope you learned something. Please like and subscribe if you like this kind of content and want to see more of it. Make sure to go watch part one of this video if you missed it. Thank you to Epidemic Sound for supporting this channel. Make sure to click the link below to get your 30 is free. Use code IMAGINE50 to get 50% off your first two months and join the backlot wait list. We'll see you there when it launches. That's it for this video, but we'll see you in the next one.